today is on sexual immorality and property sexuality is our discussion today. However, because a long topic, I'm dividing it into three parts. Part one, part two, and part three. Part one has been recorded and the media department has promised by Tuesday you can take in the YouTube and you'll get quite a bit um, talking about this perverted sexuality. And then part three will come in that service. Again, you need to go to the YouTube uh, by Tuesday to get part three, where I'll talk about the whole um, way of overcoming the temptation to do with sex. Now, so you can see, I'm not being unfair to you. When you meet the people in the first service, remind you them they haven't had what you had. They also must go to on Tuesday to the, to the to the YouTube. Isn't that fair? Yeah. Otherwise, um, I will I will not cover as much if I just repeat what I told them. And yet, technology now allows us not to repeat because it's recorded. You can actually if you're interested. However, if you are the lesson late and have no intention of going to YouTube, what I say in this service is adequate. It's not compulsory to go to the to YouTube. So I think the choice is you are. But if you are interested in the topic, I'm sure you will create the time uh, because it will, it will really help you. Um, and I think that will, that will be important. So during the past service, we have emphasized quite a bit about the fall of man and, and, and the, the whole issue about how we end up in sin. I read Genesis chapter 3 about the fall of man and uh, how in the end man ended up to be involved in sin. As, as written in Genesis chapter, chapter 3. Um, I also tried to answer the question, why is there so much immorality, especially in this generation? What's leading us to, to that? Um, but I want to emphasize to you in this service that sex is a sin like any other sin. So the people involved in sex are not more of sinners than the ones who stole your pen last week. I'm not communicating. Stealing is no worse or better than sex sin. Both of them are sins. And if they're involved in sin, the one who stole a pen will go to hell. But the one who had sex will also go to hell. When they're in hell, they'll be asking each other, why are you here? Oh, me. I slept with many women. And you, I stole many pens. Now, it will not matter what you did. You'll be in the same hell, same temperature. It, it will not matter. So you need to understand clearly that you not start thinking that this one has no help. And exactly the same, like I told the past service, it's exactly the same. Some of you are having sex with your girlfriend. Two willing adults. You love Jesus, so you claim it, but you have, you have changed the word of God, so you have sex. Some of you, you are claimed to be saved, and you're even cohabiting. Have you heard of the word cohabiting? Cohabiting means, I'm not yet committed, let's try. And you stay together. It has economic uh, implications. Because now, instead of paying rent here, rent here, and your wife, <laughs> so why don't you just stay together, save money, and if you are going to hell and I'm going to hell, we are fighting us on our way to hell. <laughs> so we, you need to understand that it will not, the cohabiting person is not less of a sinner because after all it's one partner. Because the word of God is clear. <laughs> The only sex you can have is with a person you are committed to for life. Sex outside that one person is called immorality. And it's a way of booking a location in hell. So you don't start thinking, but me, I, 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 that one is bad. He's with his prostitutes. No, the one who slept with prostitutes last week is not worse than the one who slept with his girlfriend yesterday. Because the definition in the Bible does not talk about are you having sex with a fat one or another one, with an eight or with a seven. It doesn't quite matter who you had sex with. 
a simply you are set with somebody who is not your spouse. Am I going to get it? So do not allow those generations. You need to understand even the time it doesn't matter. If you have sex with your wife to be on the morning of, on the, morning of the wedding, my friend, you are still booked a location in hell. I'm not going to get it. If, and, uh, you know, in the morning you do it, then the pastor asks, do you know the reason? Of course, the two of you know the reason. Why you cannot have your own problem? But nobody knows. It's just the two of you. But God actually, the other three people, you, the Lord, and the devil. Remember the devil them you. So you also know what you did. And the fact that you did it in the manner of the wedding will not make it any less a sin than the one cohabiting. Am I communicating? So we need to start at that level. We understand one sin is no worse than the other if the, if the penalty is a sin. And the penalty is alive in hell. So that needs to be understood. So, what is your argument? Is your argument that you know I love her? Ah, remember, the word of God did not say that immorality is simply that God don't love. So love cannot reduce the sin. The fact that you love her does not make it less of her. See, but you know, my boyfriend loves me. How could I say not me? Yeah, obviously, if your, boy love, your boyfriend loves you on his way to hell and doesn't want to go out. You want to go with you. So your choice is, I try loving me now to join him on his way to hell. That's the choice you have to make. And these days, I'm told it's not just, it's not just boys who are like that. Some girls will ask him, you call yourself a man and you call yourself my boyfriend. What kind of a man are you? <laughs> I don't understand. I'm going to drop you. Why? Because you are not a real man. Well, how can I? I mean, the girl is so nice to you. You feel like I don't want to lose her. So end up in sex. You know that girl is on her way to hell, but she's looking for company. My brother, drop <laughs> her like a horse. What is it? If you don't want to go to hell. Like I was telling the first service, you must remember, she is right, she is beautiful, she is beguiled, a dream. But also remember three things. The fact that you will beguiled may be what the devil is using to get you to sin. Number two, although she is beguiled, after three children, she will be a drum. So really, this is very right. This is very right. So do not get caught up by the beguiled. After three children, she will be and she will be just a good woman. Because you see, the one you marry is not the outside. You marry the person who stays inside. Am I communicating? And you can be a beautiful person in a crowd or in a brain. You are too beautiful. The sight sometimes does not bother you. When I, my wife Rebecca met me, we met in the, in the university. When she saw me, or oh, it will be 50 years, not too far from now. When she saw me, I used to have an afro hairstyle. <laughs> I wish you saw my picture so when I was in the university. I was the chairman of the university of Christian and I did so in Japan. And um, you know, at times you're not happy to university because there was, only, there was only one in Kenya. And so I, had a, I used to have an actual hairstyle as a senior chairman. But the trouble is, after a few years, the hair started disappearing. <laughs> now you can see, it started from here and it's also starting from the <laughs> But I'm still the same job. I'm not going to get it. So you need to understand, do not start thinking that because the person is beautiful, it will make it less of a sin. Cohabiting is not sharing a house. Cohabiting is sharing a bed. Are we together? And there's nothing wrong with sharing a house. There's something wrong with sharing a bed. However, <laughs> you need to understand clearly that if you are a man and I am a girl and we share a house, we will soon share a bed. Because that's where God created us. He created us such that when you are near a woman, she should affect you sexually. So if you actually go to stay in the same room with a girl, no intention of having sex, simply to, to reduce costs. 
you are just with your right title a fool. <laughs> because the truth is, your same cost, and you need to save the money because soon you will be having a baby. So, in addition, you are saving, you are saving for look at the baby because you soon have a baby. Because the way God created us, when you are near a woman and you are a boy, and you know you are in the same room, she has to change once in a while, isn't it? She will cover my toes when you are out in the open. In the room, you are sharing the room. She will open them. My friend, if you share a room with a girl and you feel nothing, please come for prayer and fasting. <laughs> You are not biologically okay. I'm not feeling it. So when you hear God telling you I'm cohabiting, tell them they are a declare. And what's wrong with it? I'm a Christian. I'm cohabiting. Who said it's wrong? Don't judge me. You are saying, please start a prayer and fasting session. I am not biologically okay. So when a girl comes near you or touches you and you feel something. Start by saying, hallelujah, I'm no more. No, but they say, now that I know I'm no more, I cannot stay here. I'm not going to get it. So, when a girl embraces you, and some of them can embrace you very tightly, am I right? And then feeling uncomfortable. Say, hallelujah, I'm no more. But because I'm no more, please keep away. Now, you need to understand, if you're not affected by girls embracing you, it's a very worrying thing. Brethren, are you hearing me? Brothers, are you listening to me? If, if, if girls can embrace you, kiss you, touch you, and you feel absolutely nothing, it's a very serious medical case. And you need to deal with it as a medical case. That's why people say, people are judging. I find some of you are in that generation where after the few meeting, a girl jumps on you, embraces you. And he said, don't judge me. I feel nothing. Now, I, I agree you feel nothing. Because you are not, you are not biological. Okay. It's a very serious matter. If you are biological, okay. The only reason you can embrace a girl and squeeze her. Now, some of you don't they just embrace. They embrace her and squeeze. It's either because you are not biological, okay. Or because you are preparing for sex. It's called foreplay. Africa. <laughs> Embracing people is for play. Africa to real sex. So when you are a Christian, you don't play those games. You are a Christian, you are biologically okay. There is no way two of you can be in the same room with the door locked. If I found you, two of you, a boy and a girl, in the same room and you are locked, I've only two alternatives. One or both of you are not biologically okay. I need to start praying. Or alternatively, you are intentionally have sex sooner or later. That's why don't cheat yourself. We can cohabit. Everybody who cohabits is either planning to have sex or have been having sex or will soon have sex. Am I communicating? And it doesn't matter. Let's we can say I'm seeing the introduction. Sex, according to the Bible, is not defined by you sleeping with a girl. It is defined by you lasting of a girl. The Bible says, Old Testament says, don't commit that over it. New Testament says, after time is not just when you sleep with a girl, we are not married to. If you look at a woman lastfully, the Bible doesn't say you have been tempted to have sex. You have already committed sex. The standards of the New Testament are just important standards. Only one people can help you. That is saying, if you look at a woman and desire to sleep with her, you need to repent of sexual immorality, just like the one who slept. I say, God, I never was sitting in the service. Uh, how could you? Uh, no, 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 no. You know the truth. You look at her and she looked potential. And it's only you could not carry out if you need a certain service. Now, the good thing is, the Lord is willing to repent, to forgive you. But you must forgive last, as if it is actually sex. And don't quote me, quote Jesus. Say, if you look at a woman last week, you are going to commit that? I don't tell you. My sister, if you look at a man and wish you can sleep with her, with him, 
It's not that you have been tempted, you have already committed adultery. So let me ask you a question then. How could you cohabit? <laughs> if even looking is causing you trouble, even if you stay together and don't ever sleep with one another, you're already immoral. Simply by the Lord. That's why we don't have we don't do pornography. Why? Pornography is looking at a woman lastly, only she is not physically there. It's a picture. It's not what pornography is. They will say, if you look at pornography, it's not that you repent of having been tempted, you have already committed adultery. Because you see, why are you looking at pornography? So that you can feel nice. That feeling nice is what we are calling see. Am I going to it? That's why you cannot be a Christian and participate in watching pornography. Pornography is actually sexual sin. And yet you have not slept with anybody. In fact, some people argue, but you know, nobody will get pregnant. Sure. But who told you pregnancy is a sin? Pregnancy is not a sin. It's what you do for the girl to get. And what you are doing is what is a sin. So you need to understand clearly that part of the reason why there is so much sexual immorality is because of wrong definition of sin. Let me go one step further. The people who end up in LGBTQ, the main argument is I feel like it. In other words, my pleasure drives me to it. And that's how you understand people in homosexual relationships are no more sinners than you sleep with your girlfriend. Because the reason why you sleep with your girlfriend is sexual desire. The reason why the man is sleeping with another man is sexual desire. So when you give in to homosexuality, you will go to the same hell that somebody who sleeps with his girlfriend will go to. When you are in hell, you ask each other, why are you here? Oh, I slept with many men. And you are a man, what's wrong with you? No, but just a moment. Then why did you come here? I slept with many women. It will not matter whether you slept with women or men. It will be the same hell, same so we need to understand that as we do this subject. So this idea of thinking homosexuals are queer, they are terrible, yes, just like you and your girlfriend. There's no difference. You, you are even worse, you come to the scene, you make the homosexual never came. And yet you are cohabiting. I'm not asking you to stop cohabiting. I'm only telling you to be aware. You are aware? To hell. I'm not communicating. And if you truly want to go to heaven, this service was set apart for your repentance. You may be here and you're, not, you're a non Christian. Maybe you're not a lot, they are wrong. You need to come to where you understand God hates sexual immorality. And because He hates it, if you truly want God's help and to walk with Him, you must repent. And I want to ask you during this service to come to repentance and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Why must you get born again? Because the truth is, in our own power, we can't manage. And by the way, it doesn't end up in humanity. For about 10 years, I used to work for Shell in the region office. So I'll spend my time trying. I used to cover Madagascar, Mauritius, uh, all the way up to Djibouti, Sudan. About 10 countries. I was in hotels continuously. Away from my wife. And the devil whispers. I'm not communicating. <laughs> you know, I still remember being at the Hilton, at the Hilton in, 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 um, in Addis Ababa. And I would stay several weeks in Sheer, Ethiopia. And so over the weekend I'll be there. And I'm in the swimming. They have a they have a hot water swimming pool, naturally hot water. They build a hotel next to a hot water springs. So it's a very nice way. So I go to the I come out. And then there's a girl where I want to, to take tea before going to back to my room. There's a girl over there. And she's looking at me, and of course I'm not fully dressed. She's looking at, the, at me. Then she moves to another table over there. My friend, if I allow the girl to move. <laughs> <laughs> and I know I am biologically okay. When I think of the whether I'm biologically. Okay, if you're not man, I'm married. I'll be regretting it later. I'm not communicating. The critical thing is to remember, am I biologically? Okay. 
My sister, if you are biologically okay, when a brother touches your shoulder and you feel nothing, absolutely nothing, don't be sure about it. It just means there's something not, you are not sure about. Because it is God so built our body. So when a boy touches you, your shoulder, you should start feeling something. Some sisters will pretend they are feeling nothing. So the boy takes the heart a little lower. And you feel nothing. We did not tell them to be around your bottoms. Now, by the time the direction is going there, do not pretend you don't know what was happening. Unless you are not biological. Okay, my sister, when a brother embraces you and you feel something, start by saying, Hallelujah, I'm normal. But because I'm normal, let me run away. I'm not communicating. So if you, you need to understand that. But the point I want you to emphasize is what matters is to realize. Sin, then repent. God is willing to forgive us. That's why Christ died on the cross. So that any one of us who has participated in sex, either in his mind or in reality, can come to God in repentance. Even if you have been cohabiting, just to get decide to come out of that room, you might have to look for another Christian, another Christian girl to host you for a while. But you can't go back, you cannot repent and go back to the same poverty room. Why? You know you are biologically? Okay. So you move out. You must behave in a manner that allows the Holy Spirit to work within you. So that you can, you can have what I'm calling the first service. Secondary virginity. And I think that's, that will be important. Anyway, all I'm saying is, all sin is bad. Every type of sin will take you to hell. But sex sin has sociological impact or not. In other words, <laughs> if you steal whatever, all of them are wrong. But the Bible says what is wrong with the sex is because you are sinning against your own body. And many people who are involved in sex, they end up having spiritual problems. Because the Bible is saying, when you have sex with a prostitute, you become one with her. And you're opening your life to demonic control. Sex is a sin, like any other of you hell. But sex is one of the most important uh, demonic uh, entry points. You sleep with somebody, you have no idea who they are, you are becoming one with them, with their demonic control. And soon enough, you discover yourself. And that's why you find somebody. They have no intention of having sex. They have sex once. But from after the first sex, it becomes very difficult to receive sex after that. The spiritual control is on. And there are many people currently having sex. In their heart, they don't want to have it. But their body can't do without sex. They require deliverance. Am I communicating? It all began by having sex with one person. So sex has a theological connotation. That guilt of having sex before the wedding can ruin your marriage. Every time you have sex, now you are proper married, you have sex, and you remember the scene you did with the boy at our tree. And all of a sudden the guilt comes, and you just recover yourself as a boy becoming impotent. And you wonder, my husband can't perform. It's because every time he touches you, he remembers what he did under a tree. Sex before marriage is a precursor to destruction of marriage because of those old guilt days revisiting you during marriage. I'm emphasizing sexual immorality has sociological connotations and it can follow you for the rest of your life. Interfering with the joy. You will enjoy sex for three minutes. It will destroy sex for the next 30 years. That's why it's not something you can play around with. And the other thing you need to understand is the moment you have sex before marriage, it means you are unable to control yourself. When you are unable to control yourself, you discover you don't have much control. So even after the wedding, all you require is for your wife to go for a trip. Or you to go for a trip, the way you should do a job when I'm traveling a lot. And if before the wedding I could not control myself, remember, practice makes perfect. So you cannot control yourself as a single boy. 
rest assured, it will be harder to control yourself as a married person. And you know, your wife is not becoming available, it's normal. She gets pregnant, the doctor says, don't touch her the final months of pregnancy. And don't touch her a few months after the birth of the child. But if you can't control yourself, you can justify it. Why did you go to another woman? My wife was not available. Now, you have now come to where you think sex is oxygen. And you know that with oxygen, you can't close your, your nose for more than four minutes without corrupting. My friend, I'm here to tell you, sex is not like oxygen. You can do without sex and be normal. But the moment you start giving in to sex before the wedding, you have opened up yourself to loosening yourself so that even after marriage, sex. That's what I was telling the first service. If a Christian boy comes to you telling you, hey, I can't wait. But if we are going to marry, why can't we sleep together? And when we are not going to marry, so you are going to marry me. My friend, the moment you feel a Christian boy is telling you to have sex with him, understand he has no control. And remember the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. And he's telling me, the Spirit is not in me. <laughs> the devil is. Now, you need to understand. You need to understand the moment a boy asks you for sex, you need to drop him like a hot potato. Because you see, he is telling you openly, he has a wrong spirit within him. The fruit within him is a demonic one. Why would you want to, go to marry such a like that? Because if he asks you for sex, it means he has been struggling on his own. And other boys also struggle. But they don't say, this one has already reached a level where he said, can we have sex? That you should have in a relationship with such a boy. Drop him as quickly as possible. The only way you can drop him if you believe God has somebody for you to marry. And although he is a good boy, the manufacturer is still manufacturing because of good boys. And the factory is not yet closed. So you drop him because you know God can get you somebody else. My brother, if your girlfriend is leading you to sex, Drop her like a hot potato. Some of these girls will get into trouble. That's why they come to you with a dress that is too low from above and too high from below, and they come and sit on your bed, they get dressed, get even shorter, and <laughs> either she doesn't think you are normal. And if, you, if she knows you are not normal, why is she coming to be your boy girlfriend? If she knows you are normal and comes like that, because she wants you to go to she has ever looked at that and going to hell, she's looking for company. You cannot continue in a relationship with somebody who is sexually immoral. And I think it's important. So I want you to emphasize it has sociological implications long term for you and your marriage. And statistics are showing children of people that are immoral find it difficult for them not to become immoral. Somebody did a study in prisons in the US and found that. 65% of all people in prison came from parents that were not having a stable marriage. So you need to understand you are what you are beginning in the first level could go to the third and fourth generation. When you are able to go to your wedding as a virgin man, you are going to bequeath your children stability and ability to control. And that's why it's important to ask yourself, is that where you are? But I want to repeat again. If you are actually already fallen, we don't give up on you. The blood of Jesus is adequate. But the blood of Jesus is useless to people who have not yet repented. The difficult thing is, like I told the first time, at the minute you have seen either in your mind or in your, in your body, at the minute that it's against God, the number three, help God forgive you. Because Jesus died on the cross for going of sin. And number four, turn direction. And now do not do anything that disposes you to go into sex. That means you can't watch the wrong views. That means you cannot allow your girlfriend to your room without the door being open. That means you cannot wear a dress that is going to tempt your, your boyfriend. You now live in a way to avoid the devil tempting you or the issues of sex. And that will be an important issue. You know, 
the whole issue I'm describing is the issue of lust. And a lot of people will tell you, I love you, but what they mean is, I love myself. Last is not a good business for marriage. You know, to last is to want somebody so that you relieve your sexual urge. Young men look for somebody to relieve their sexual urge. Of course, when, they, when he approaches the girl, he doesn't say, I have last. He says, I love you. In fact, he says, I love you so much, I can't sleep unless I see you tonight. Come to my house. I'll die unless you come. The truth of the matter is, he doesn't love you. He loves himself. If anybody loves you, my sister, he will not go to sleep with you before the wedding day. For three reasons. Number one, if he sleeps with you, he is weakening your resistance long term. Number two, if he sleeps with you, you might end up pregnant. And if he loves you, he does not want you to get pregnant in advance. And you know, non Christians don't need to get pregnant. Because they only prepare. Christians do not prepare, so they have no orders or things like that. They are walking with the Lord. Then you have a boyfriend who says, I can't wait. Soon enough, you have. Now he doesn't love you for him to want you to be pregnant. Am I right? And then I think you need to understand, we are told by the experts, every time you sleep with a boy, you have slept with the six women he slept with before he came to you. And if he wants to sleep with you, it's proving now that there may be somebody else here sleeping with. So you are actually predisposing yourself to HIV. So nobody will ask for sex before the wedding day. And even on the wedding day, I always insist on asking the couple about to marry together to go for HIV test. That does not mean you're not married, but it's the open, let's be clear. So before you can sleep with somebody, do the HIV test. And if your boyfriend resists, drop him. Because if he knows he is okay, how come he does not want to be tested? If your girlfriend is resisting HIV test before the wedding, leave him. That's a good enough sign. They know what they have carried, although they have never told you. So if you really, if a boyfriend loves you, he will want to go for a HIV test. Because if he was sick, he will not want his sickness to start affecting you. Because he loves you. What is love? Love is a strong desire for the good of another. I repeat, what is love? A strong desire for the good of the other. What is lust? A strong desire to meet your own needs. Can you see the difference between the two words? So you can always tell whether you love someone or you don't love. Anyone you love, you feel like sacrificing in order to, to for their better. I've written a book called Friendship. Next time you are in the focus office, just look at the book on friendship. And I try to divide friendship, lust, and love. And I'm saying you cannot waste your love because when you love someone, you rather if there is food and it's only not one, you feel like, no, no, let me say hungry, you eat. That is love. A desire for the good of the other person. That means you love them. If a desire is to meet your own personal need, that is called lust. And so you need to understand the mistake of a lot of sexual issues are coming, not because of love, but because of lust. And we need to ask ourselves, is that what we are doing or not? Um, you know, one of the things people are doing is redefining sin. A lot of people think sin is being caught doing wrong. In other words, if I, if you don't catch me, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a sin. Sin is being caught. That's why a lot of people are going to another world to hide sin because they think in terms of being caught. But you know, sin has not been being caught. You are a sinner, whether caught or or not. It doesn't matter. Because the, the whole issue is about the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is present. He knows what you have done or not done. So you need to understand that. That's why, like I said during the past service, pregnancy is not a sin. It's what you did before the pregnancy. And those who, those who did it and never got pregnant are not less sinful than you who is pregnant. Because you see, a lot of girls, they think that's a sin. How could he get pregnant? 
No. That's the pregnancy is a sign of blessing. How many women are trying to get pregnant? They can't. You, once you become your pregnancy, hallelujah, then you will give me a child. And I say, but by the way, Lord, I did wrong. Forgive me. Because that's what you need to understand. I want you to understand, sin is not being caught. Sin is doing wrong. Whether caught or, or not. So don't go into great length of avoiding, of avoiding getting pregnant. That's not the issue. Avoid doing the sin. Number two, please understand, sin is not having sex. It's imagining sex. So if you start defining matters according to Jesus Christ at the level of the mind, will you ever do the physical sin? No. If you regard looking at a girl laughing at a sin, there is no way you go to the extent of asking her for sex. Because you have dealt with your temptation at the level of the mind. And that really is something you have to, to deal with in your own, in your own, in your own mind. If you check chapter 3 verse, it's Richard chapter 5 verse 3 says, But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality, or of any kind of impurity, or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Are you, are you getting it? It's not a question of the sin itself, but a hint. Hey, that's a strong one. Hint. You know what? Don't behave in a manner as you suggest. No, you, have, you hear people who are cohabiting say, what's wrong with cohabiting? Cohabiting is a hint that you are doing something under the Lord's door. The Bible is saying, don't enter into... I had someone preaching, but he was preaching in Kukuyu. He called it, Mehia Mabu Oneke, sin that look like sin. A Christian is being told, don't enter there. Don't do things that make it look like sin, although actually it is not sin. You can't enter there. That's why you cannot be with a girl in a locked room. The but you did nothing. The issue is not what you did. You gave a hint of doing something. That's really what the word of God is saying. Let there not even be a hint. Then, in, um, then we go on in Revelation 19.7. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. In other words, Jesus is coming and the church is his bride. He is saying the bride might be ready any time. So this time, you are saying that I will have sex and repent. Have you agreed with Jesus when he's coming? Jesus said, I don't even know when I'm coming. Only the Father knows. So he's saying, you are living in righteousness. Must be 24 7. Why? Jesus can come any time and he's coming with his bride. So there's a that time you can feel, but you know, after all, now I'm a student. Jesus can come when you're a student. Am I right? Oh, you know, but you know now I'm young and hot. No, no, no. He will not wait until you are old. He can come any time. So he's saying, the reason why you live in righteousness and not end up in perverted sex. And remember for me, I'm including all immorality, whether it's homosexuality, all the LG and DA, all of them are all sexual immorality, including sleeping with your girlfriend. They are all, they are all the same. Romans, Romans chapter 7, verse 2 and 3. For example, by law, a married woman is found to her husband as long as he is alive. But if, he, if her husband dies, she is received from the law of marriage. So then, if she marries another man while her husband is still alive, she is called under the arrest. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law and is not under the arrest, even though she marries another man. In other words, we are learning. Sex is okay, but it's a, like a bind. In other words, you must enter into a prison of marriage <laughs> before, the, before you have sex. But marriage is a prison. Because as soon as you are married, you now cannot move out to another woman. And you can't even leave this one. Because divorce is not part of Christianity. I know a lot of Christians are divorcing, but he says, I hate divorce. So you see, you are married. A woman, once she marries, she is totally tied to her husband. And if she tries to leave him, she is committing adultery. Have you read that? 
So it's important to understand what that means then. You who is single cannot dare, even the one who is married can't. You also cannot enter into, into that business. Um, let me repeat. Sex is not like oxygen. So you cannot say the reason I'm having sex, oh my body, what could I have done? You can't die. Am I communicating? So don't start feeling like you must have sex. It's not oxygen. So you don't have to be involved. Except when it comes in the blessing of marriage. And once you are married, I've just told you, is them. What is adultery? Adultery, I as an school child say, is adult error. Adult time. Adult error. These are adults pretending to be older than they actually are. It's a sin of pretending to be a free, freer than you actually are. Thinking of the freedom. See, I love this girl. He loves me. I'm free. I can do what I want. That's what I'm telling you. Sex outside marriage is totally condemned in the scriptures. Only the married bed should be honored. Any other bed, whether it's behind the bush or in the Hilton Hotel, is actually condemned. Let's read Hebrews 13 4. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all sexually immoral. That's what God has said. So you need to understand sex will only be possible once you enter in that. Sexual sin is having sex with anyone else other than the one you are with. So if you really want to be to have sex, come out of it, and you must then have a wedding. What's a wedding? A wedding is not the tea and the cake. A wedding is a time where a man of God prays for your future marriage and declares you in the name of the Lord as husband and wife. Jesus said, let what God has joined together, no man put a son. Not what the dowry has joined together. So even after the dowry is through the pain, and the father of the girl says the girl is yours. You can't touch her, you're a Christian. The marriage dowry is irrelevant. The only way you can have sex is if God joins you together. Dowry that John join you together. Even the two of you can't like I love you, I love you, let's stay together. It's a little talk, it's come with stay, come with stay. You are not properly. You have to wait and kill, not the two of you, but God joins you together. The book of James says, when you have something important, call the pastors, call the elders. They are the ones who can speak on behalf of God. So whatever your attack is, don't have sex until you go to the man of God and behalf of God. You are joined together. Let what God has joined together. That wedding is not an addition. The thing is, the king is, but the actual prayer of the man of God is a requirement of the scriptures. I repeat. Jesus is saying, let what God has joined together. No man put aside. So any marriage other than being brought together by God is not a Christian marriage. That's where wedding must happen. However, I'm unhappy with a lot of churches who they are making weddings look like it's a cake. It is the people. They are making it complicated. I've attended weddings where it is done during the Sunday service. In other words, somebody told me, the pastor tells me, when you come next Sunday, don't be surprised, you'll be doing a wedding. I said, when? He does what you speak. So people are called, they say the vows, they are praying together, they sit down, I continue to preach. Afterwards, there's no cake. They just meet the people and go home. And they are as married as those who are in white and having tea. Tea is not part of the wedding. The wedding is a prayer and a pronouncement. Am I going to so instead of cohabiting, just come to the pastor here. So you have another church with the uh, other church of where there is a pastor, am I right? Here on campus. Tell him you want to get him. He will register the matter in the Attorney General. Three weeks people will be given to see that you are okay and you will be during a Sunday service. Not him at all. So you should understand and you must separate the two. So that you can actually work now and give us three, five years later when you have the money. But don't dare sleep with a girl before God has joined you together. Oh, oh but you know, you want a big wedding, have it. 
but you can have it after you are wedded. And I know that those things happen, like during the, during the COVID, weddings were not allowed to have people. So people were there, and then after COVID, they got a tea, and it was as sweet as if we had it during COVID. But they already married. So don't mix the two. Calling us for tea, especially if you are rich, don't be going to come. Give us the tea. But it does, you don't have to wait for the wedding at the time you can afford the tea. Am I clear? So that when God says you can't have sex, He's not saying you can't have sex until you have the money. You can have sex and you don't have money. As long as you have God before the man of God and you have to be sure he's a man of God because he's not doing it on his behalf. He's doing it on behalf of God. What God has joined together. And because he's a legal, he's a legal matter, he also must be registered in that of Jenny. Don't agree to be married by somebody who is not in that of Jenny or is registered as a man of God. Of course, the register doesn't make him a man of God. He must, work, must be a man of God. But in a believer, must go there. And that's what you really need to understand. That any sex before it, don't say it because you are preparing for a wedding. There's nothing to prepare in a wedding. You can have a wedding. I, I, maybe I should tell you, when I got married in 1929, when I did, a, I don't work for two, just over two years or something, and, I, and when I did my, my example, I thought, hey, we have to cut this, we are doing my, with my, with Rebecca. And we started looking for what items can we remove. We just decided the cake is too expensive. You know, one cake, you pay the kind of money that can buy 10 loaves. And in those days, in the 1970s, you could not have a wedding without people eating bread with jam. You know? So how many loaves are you going to a cake? So we just said, no cake. Next time we are meeting our friends, we told them, please don't be surprised, there will be no cake. So one of my friends says, how? Never had a wedding without a cake. I said, show me the scriptures where it is says, <laughs> Thou shalt not have a wedding without cake. They could not show me. One of them decided, I'll buy. I said, if you use your money, don't ask me for you. If you use your money, I don't mind eating a cake. But it's not a priority in our wedding. So we had never got a cake, but not as part of our budget. I'm not going to get So I'm not telling you things you have not, you have not done. So a lot of people are ending up in sexual immorality, waiting to give us a big wedding. Have it at your size. Then when you are finally free, call us together. You can give it another name. Say, you are coming to praise the Lord for marriage. Because <laughs> you are already married. So, and you will come. Make a big cake, now you can afford it. We don't eat it. If we are, so don't mix the two. The cake and the wedding are not relatives. Are we together? Do it separately. But the critical thing I'm emphasizing is the wedding is not an addition. It's a biblical requirement of the scriptures. It's God to bring you together. Let God, what God has, join. That joining is what you call a wedding. And it will be important that, uh, that you, you see how important the thing, the thing is. I have to find out finish. So, please understand that sexual sin is sleeping with anyone you are not wedded to. And whether it is before you are married or after you are married, it is still sexual sin. Sometimes we call sexual sin before the wedding fornication. And we call the sexual sin after the wedding, we call it adultery. But those are just terms. It's both a sexual immorality and we need to be aware about it. Let us pray. I want to ask you a question. Are you walking with the Lord? The things I'm describing, do they describe your life? Might you be somebody who is actually booked to go to hell because of your sin? Might you not be born again? The good news is, you do not have to move out of this service with any, with any fear of the Lord condemning you. Because He's ready to forgive you. So I want you to pray for yourself. Lord, you know me. I'm asking you to forgive me. But I'm also making a commitment to be your child, to be born again, and to walk with you for the rest of my life. Whether you are born again or not born again, if there is something you are repenting, 
I want to pray with you. Would you like to put your hand so that I include in the prayer? You're saying, Lord, that message is my message. I want your forgiveness. I don't want to walk out of this place with any guilt. Just put up your hand. Once I see it, you put it down. We are showing it to God that you really admit. I told you what matters is admitting that the Lord will handle and cover you. And you move of this service with what I'm calling secondary virginity because you know God has forgiven. Put up high now. The Lord bless you. Put the hand out. The Lord bless you. Put the hand out. The Lord bless you. Put the hand out. Upstairs, that I've seen, put the hand out. The Lord bless you. Put the hand out. It's just between you and God. Don't look around. It's your life. Look at your life. God wants to forgive you. And he wants you to come out here committed to secondary virginity. It doesn't matter how the past was. The future is now forgiven and protected by God. Don't look up a second time. But just before I pray, anybody else? Smooth the tie now for me to, to, to know the Lord bless you. Anybody else? Before I pray, the Lord bless you. The upstairs, high enough for me to see. You, you have the Lord bless you. At the back, far back, put up high enough for me to say, you are telling the Lord, yes, it's me. I want your forgiveness. Lord Jesus, you can see the hands of all these people. Each one of them say, that is my message. Yes, I'm as guilty as church, but I don't want to go to hell. You died on the cross for my forgiveness, and I'm asking you to forgive me. I pray for each one of those who put up their hands. That Lord, right now, in the name of Jesus, they will receive your forgiveness. But secondly, that you help them to keep their commitment, to listen to your voice, to use all the power you give them to walk in righteousness because of your grace. And I pray that as we go out of this service, they will walk in the victory, assured that God will walk with them into the waking with secondary virginity and into the future being tied up to one person they have been committed to for life. There may be other people here who have not put up their hands, but the Spirit of God is brooding over them. Pray, Lord, that you will give them no peace until they admit they need a Savior and seek your forgiveness. In Jesus' name we pray.